I'd like to welcome you. I don't know all of you, and you don't know all of me. That's why I have a little sign. And my name is Constance, and I am an artist, a painter, a printmaker, a liturgical artist, tapestry designer, and weaver who decided to return to graduate school to become an art therapist. I wanted to know, uh, I know on a personal level that art heals. It also empowers, and it processes, it assesses, and it communicates. And I felt, in, after doing art my whole life since, I, I cannot remember a time when I did not draw, but I wanted to return the gift to others. And this was very challenging for me for several reasons. One is that I'm dyslexic. So the amount of reading and writing was very, and speaking was very difficult for me, as you'll find out today. <laughs> that is one reason I draw and do art that's nonverbal. It took me eight years to get through two years of graduate school to get my master's degree. I could only take one class at a time. The advantage was I know about every art therapist up and down the coast, you know, in that eight years. My internship uh, when uh, I got to that point was at a 5150 unit in San Francisco for adolescents who were danger to self, others, or gravely disabled. It was an intense opportunity, and I worked there for four years before going to School of the Blind to finish my art therapy hours and, my, and I worked on my MFT hours at the same time. Um, then after um, the School of the Blind, which is in Fremont, across from the School of the Deaf, I then worked with an elder church quilting group creating a names <coughs> quilt project quilt for the 22 men in the congregation who had died of AIDS, including their organist. It was 12 feet by 12 feet in stained glass quilting, which I'd never done before, but we learned together. With the scraps of that quilt, I continued with them to create baby quilts for battered women's shelters. So another internship with elders where I began here at Age Song, taking, uh, I was working at another facility, but I was taking my supervision with uh, Nader and Doris Bursing. Um, and I worked here, well, did my internship, of which we had one afternoon of training a month at the end of the month. <laughs> it's a little different now. Um, and this building was being built. I came with the building. They hired me as soon as this building was built. So I have been here since 2006 as an intern, as um, you are here, and, but also as an enrichment coordinator and as an art therapist. And it has been a real gift for me to work and create and process and be with the people here. They are incredibly wonderful people. And before we begin, um, Vincent told me that I'll be here in September for a couple hours, and then in November for a couple hours, every other month, and we'll have two hours together. So I'm just going to kind of do a really, really <coughs> brief overview of um, expressive arts therapy or creative arts therapy, which encompasses many, many disciplines. Uh, also know that each discipline has its own programs and degrees that specialize in these precise uh, creative form. There's drama therapy. Has anybody taken any drama therapy? Good, excellent. Music therapy. Any music therapists? Ah, good. Movement, dance therapy? Oh. Written words, storytelling, poetry? Excellent. Art therapy? Me. <laughs> uh, psychodrama? Good. Sand tray? Yes. Yes, uh, and this I had never heard of, horticultural <coughs> therapy, gardening. I chose art therapy, but I have used poetry, I've used sand tray, I've used music, and done some forms of drama. Um, so I do kind of be a little more eclectic than just art therapy. 
So we have a little less than an hour, so I'm going to just kind of briefly, once again, um, and uh, go over some of the history of art therapy, but we're going to flesh that out, so I'm just going to do the major categories. And uh, the first one is um, art therapy comes from three strands or roots uh, that create what we know as art therapy today, and then it has kind of bloomed into all these other uh, uh, gestalt art therapy and Jungian art therapy and so on. But the main ones were um, psychology, and that was a woman named Nanberg. Art education, a man that I totally uh, respect and honor, his name was Victor Lohenfeld. And when we start doing, looking at art as assessment, which you've probably all done with projected tests, uh, we'll learn how he talks about stages of drawing and ages. And you'll see echoed here, some of those, some of the people are drawing on a six-year-old level, if you were to look at his stages. Uh, but it just gives you, how do you actify their passive knowledge? You know, how do you get to bring the sky down to the earth? Or, uh, so on. Studio art, and a woman named Edith Kramer, who just died last, um, this last year. What is the function of art therapy, do you think? Any ideas? Self-expression. Self-expression, good. What else? Well, just a different like medium. You don't have to use your words. You can... You have, it gives you something more tangible to express yourself with. Right. You've got, a concrete, you've got a concrete document yeah. at the end of it. In talk therapy, it could just kind of go, curious. I use it primarily because it's nonverbal. <laughs> Uh, as a what? As non, being nonverbal. You think it's empowering? Powering. How is it empowering? Yes, it's accessible to all. That's really, really an important one. Also, when you do art, it gives you the opportunity to make choices. You get to make choices. And his daughter was talking about, you know, some of these people are fed and they just say, you know, you're eating this, <laughs> and or you're, we have to take you to the restroom now, or, you know, they don't have, you know, we get up in the morning, we choose to drink coffee or tea or have Cheerios or skip breakfast and go to Boulange. Um, but we have a lot of choices that we make, sometimes too many, but they have very, very few choices that they make. And so choice making is important and it is empowering. And also for them to create something out of nothing that comes into being that they were a part of. It also is communication. They have something I can show you. Look at them, you know? This is what I did today. <laughs> well, I did it all week. You know, this is, you know, they can, you begin a dialogue. You can hear what they have to say. And it is life enhancing. It's for any and all populations. As I said, I worked at the School of the Blind, where blindness was the least of the disabilities that they had. So I painted and with children at the School of the Blind. There are three categories that I just really, really uh, want to emphasize today. This is, as Nader was saying, a fragile population. And uh, so safety concerns are really important. If you hear a beep, somebody went out the door, you find out who went out right now. You don't wait, oops, I have to finish this conversation. You go see who's out the door because they might be walking out in the middle of the street. You know? So uh, you need to be aware of safety. So these are some I put together just concerning art. And there are ones with wheelchairs, there are safety concerns with food, and. Uh, we'll deal with those at another level. We only use non-toxic materials here. Why? People put things in their mouths. They put the things in their mouths. What else? Do they always wash their hands? Mm. <laughs> no, they don't always wash their hands. Uh, what kind of plants do we use for the gardening? Non-toxic, and there is a list on, um, you can Google a list of non-toxic plants if you do a gardening group. What about scissors? What do you think about scissors? <laughs> These are things we do all the time. We have scissors, sharp ones. I have embroidery scissors. I have, you know, do you think they can have scissors? 
Yes, but under monitoring. Pardon? Yes, but while being, you know, assisted. I never give them scissors. <laughs> and I will say, I was trained at School of the Blind. You probably do. <laughs> yeah. um, I keep, I bring scissors, the blunt ones, and I, these don't have pockets in, that's why I have a purse, but I keep them in my pocket. And I pre-cut everything, or I have them fold and tear, like we did Valentine's. We folded the paper and we just tore them, opened them up. Or we ripped paper one time to make uh, posters. But why, um, I learned both at School of uh, the Blind that scissors are difficult for people with sight uh, challenges for them to use without knowing where the paper is. And, and some of the people that we have have strokes. So how many sides of the body do they have access to? One, so they can't hold a piece of paper and a scissor at the same time, which puts them in a group at a disadvantage. So what I try to do is equal, you know, keep the playing field equal. And so I pre-cut lots of things that we're going to do. If we're going to do Valentine's, I find things for Valentine's. If we're going to do animal cards, I do pre-cut animals. And uh, then put them in categories and they have the uh, choice of doing them. The reason is, one day we were at a round table and this woman, she had scissors. All at once the scissor disappeared and she was cutting her neighbor's clothes. Mm -hmm. And then she started cutting her fingernails and then she was starting to go for the hair. And so, you know, she was experimenting with the media and but it was not a safe thing for her to have and it certainly wasn't helpful to her neighbor's clothes. So scissors, I have blunt ones and I've got them down the office. I keep one in my pocket. What about glue containers? Can they do glue? You probably use non-toxic. Non-toxic glue, right? So you use like a stick at less, it's a little more contained. Yeah, we've got glue sticks today. Not We have done the liquid glue. It is, but if somebody has a stroke and is trying to move paper, you know, and we're going to next month learn about adaptive art therapy, how to adapt things for people. Uh, what about paint? Non-toxic paint. Non paint. We do use acrylic paint for the toy project, so we will talk about it at another point. But I count. And I learned this at school, at uh, 5150 unit. I count all the containers. One day, one disappeared, and I knew who maybe, who was missing from the group, and I went, and she was taking the top off and was going to drink it. Because it looked good. It was a pretty color. So I'm really, really careful about that. With Model Magic, it's an air-dry, non-toxic clay. With um, Baker's clay, Baker's dough, what do you think they do with that? We made Christmas ornaments one year with cookie cutters. What do they think they are? Cookies. cookies. You're right. They think they're cookies. And so they started disappearing off of the Christmas tree on the second floor. So we came and took them off and we made paper ones uh, to put on. We did have a knitting group with eight people knitting. Um, for a year, we made uh, scarves for the homeless people of San Francisco that we give at Christmas time but I only get large needles so they can see them or feel them better, wooden ones and the bluntest ones I can find. I have them sit in a circle with me and we knit together. Um, what about beads, jewelry? What do you think? They need to be big. They need to be large. What will they do with them? They look like candy. candy. So, you know, maybe none of you will ever do these groups, but I just want you to be aware that if you're seeing something happening and it maybe looks not safe, that you kind of see the red flags and could go and intercede. So um, when you do anything, think first, fragile population, is this a safe thing to do? And we'll talk, we'll flesh this out a little bit uh, further. And the other thing is if you're doing a directive, a project, I always do it first. Why do I always do it first with myself? Or if I can talk anyone in my family to do it. <laughs> Why do I always do it first? 
That's see how it works. See how it works. Or if it works. How hard is it? How complicated? Could I do it with one hand? Could I do it in the time frame I have? What uh, materials do I need? You'll always try it yourself first. And what are the safety concerns? Where may it be, um, I see some red flags, or maybe need help, a, an assistant or something. So just do it yourself. What's the time frame you have? Yeah. And one, I, the third consideration that I have, and this came out of a real experience here, and um, how to talk to people about their art. So you come in and people are around a table and their art is there, they've done a drawing or a painting or a collage. You s sort of go and I look at yours and say, what would I say? That's a good one, but if I didn't know that statement, what would I say? Wow, this is, this is nice, or this is really beautiful. I'm not saying, am I saying anything about hers? No. No. So this person feels really great. Wow, your piece is really beautiful. And how does this person feel? Or the other thing, one day somebody came up to somebody in my drawing class and said, what is that? that looks like a butt. <laughs> Awestruck, I kind of was. <laughs> uh, well, I think we need some education around this one. And um, so we're going to talk about how to talk to a person about their art. And to do that, I just want to preface it with one of my favorite stories. I hope we're going to have enough time to do art. Um, once, when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book. You want to be my lovely assistant? Sure. Okay. I saw a magnificent picture in a book called True Stories from Nature about a primeval forest. It was a picture of a boa constrictor in the act of swallowing an animal. And here is a copy of the drawing. In the book it said, quote, boa constrictors follow, swallow their prey whole without chewing it. After that, they are not able to move and they sleep through six months that they need for digestion, unquote. I pondered deeply then over the adventures of the jungle. And after some work with a colored pencil, I succeeded in making my first drawing. And this will be drawing number one. This is drawing number one. I showed my masterpiece to grown-ups and asked them whether the drawing frightened them. But they answered, frightened? Why should I be frightened by a hat? My drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. But since grown-ups were not able to understand it, I made another drawing. I drew the inside of the boa constrictor so that grown-ups could see it clearly. They always need to have things explained. My drawing number two looked like this. The grown-ups response this time was to advise me to lay aside my drawings of boa constrictors, whether from the inside or the outside, and devote myself instead to ge uh, geology and geography, history, arithmetic, grammar. That is why, at age six, I gave up what might have been a magnificent career as a painter. I had been disheartened by my failure of drawing number one and my drawing number two. Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves, and it is tiresome for children to be always and forever explaining things to them. So then I chose another profession and learned to pilot airplanes. Thank you. I have flown a little uh, over all parts of the world, and it is true that geography has been very useful to me. At a glance, I can distinguish China from Arizona, and if one gets lost in the night, such knowledge is valuable. In the course of this life, I have had a great many encounters with a great many people who have been concerned with matters of consequence. I have lived a great deal among grown-ups, and I have seen them intimately close at hand, and that hasn't much improved my opinion of them. 
Whenever I met one of them who seemed to me at all clear-sighted, I tried an experiment of showing them by drawing number one, which I have always kept. And I would try to find out, so is this a person of true understanding? But whoever it was, a he or a she, would always say, that is a hat. Then I would never talk to that person about boa constrictors or primeval forests or stars. I would bring myself down to the, his level. I would talk to him about bridge and golf and politics and neckties. And the grown-up would be greatly pleased to have met such a sensible man. So with that said, how do you talk to someone about their drawing? If you see their drawing, what question? You were close. Tell me about your drawing. Because you don't know what they see in their drawing. If it's a hat, it could have been a hat, but maybe not. Maybe it was a boa constrictor eating an elephant. So always, you know, uh, in any kind of situation, especially working with people here who um, their imagination is wonderful. And so honor that by asking their permission. Yeah, tell me about your drawing. Tell me about your drawing. Would you care to share your drawing with me? Make it a safe place and let them um, invite them into the process. So with that said, we're going to do some art. If we have, wait, we have 10 minutes or so, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to go for it. And whenever I do an art therapy group, I always open the group and greet them, check in with them, say what directive we're going to do. Then at the end, we uh, kind of um, share our work. If they choose, we give them choice. As many times as possible, give them choice. And then um, we close the group. So I'm going to open the group. Please close your eyes. How do you feel at this moment in time? You've been here for many hours listening. What are you hearing now? You've been sitting for many hours. How physically do you feel? How cognitively do you have room for more? How is your spirit? When you are ready, I have over on the table over here, open your eyes, and I invite you to take a mandala. There are large ones, medium size, and small ones. So choose a large one for the most you're feeling, in a color that you can respond. That I'm feeling this, and this is the color that uh, symbolizes that for me at this moment in time. It might change over time. If you feel a little bit of something else, a little bit of, ooh, the sun's too hot, you know, <laughs> or I really need to stretch, get a little bit of that color. We're going to come back and just quickly go through, and I would like to meet each of you, but we're going to do it through colors and mandalas. Okay, they're over here. My name is Constance, and I chose the color blue. For I feel honored to be here with you today and sharing something that is very, very important to me. Uh, I chose pink because I get nervous <laughs> talking because it's not my um, medium of choice, shall we say. I feel uh, I chose green, a little bit of green, because I hope to grow and learn with you. I would appreciate feedback, uh, things you're interested in learning, and see how I can accommodate that, or if I can. And I chose black for the mystery or the open moment. 
you like to begin? My name is Cedric Jackson, and I chose red because it represents the blood of my family. Excellent. Thank you. My name is Carissa, and I chose uh, pink as being kind of representative of my health and my feelings. And yellow will be more warm sunshine. This is <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I chose green, and um, I like the green because it's a mixture of blue and yellow. It's kind of how I'm feeling today in transition with both. A uh, little blue in a sad sort of way, and then a little yellow because it's bright and I'm surrounded by new people. Um, but I still have that little bit of blue in the middle that is kind of there. Thank you. And your name? Rachel. Rachel. Hi, Lauren. I chose a small pink one, um, and I squiggled some stuff in there. Good. Because the pink is like bright. I'm excited about everything we're learning, but I'm also getting to the point today when I'm like tired, and I know there's only so much more I can fit in my head. Um, and the stuff in there is just like everything else we're gonna learn about. So. Thank you. My name is Vincent, and I chose three colors. I chose pink, green, and blue. The pink in the center kind of represents how I'm feeling in the immediate context. You know, it's kind of hot, there's lots going on, and when I say hot, I mean there's a lot of energy. It's getting something started and everything that's involved with that. Ultimately, I feel confident, optimistic, and relaxed, and that is the green and blue. You know, so while in the immediate moment I'm kind of like, ah, so much to do, I'm also very confident that things will kind of all work out to be nice and sky bluey. Good. Mona, I chose the biggest orange I could find. I also <laughs> grabbed colors because I wanted them, but uh, I think of orange as being sort of sparkly and real energetic. Yeah, I'm feeling that way. Thank you. Your name? Oh, hi, my name is Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> and I chose the big, bright, hot pink circle. But I love pink, and um, it's bright, and it makes me feel good. Um, I guess this will be my core, and so I feel the inside as well. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bright and, and happy. Yeah. Thank you. Penny. Penny. And I chose blue. Blue is, a, I love nature. It's the sky. It's the ocean. Calm. Thank you, uh, Penny. Uh, Suzanne, I chose uh, the yellow, kind of yellow green that represents sun and nature, and the Purple represents learning here, and the red uh, represents heart or compassion. Thank you. And your name? Thank you. <laughs> Drink water. Okay.
we'll have, if we have any time, we'll have that opportunity. So hold that thought. Uh, so I took Your name? Adina. Adina. Thank you. Three. Your name? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Christina, and I chose blue because that was my dad's favorite color, and he was a huge part of my transitioning here at ASOM. And I chose this um, orange, not because of the color, but because of the size, because it reminds me of family. And each song has been like a second family to me, which is why I keep coming back. So uh, that's why I chose these two colors. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> Thank you. I was markers, pastels, everything. What I would like you to do is take a mandala, and on the inside, when you kind of look at all the wealth of materials, which isn't really a wealth, but enough. Um, I would like you to put inside the mandala what your expectations for this year are, and this training, and this, you know, what you want for this time together, how we can journey forth together. And then on the outside, put what might distract you besides all the other things you're doing. <laughs> you know, what are the distractions? And if you choose around the perimeter on the inside to put some tools that you will use to kind of keep you centered. So I'll put these over here. Come on up and you can glue your mandalas on if you want. This is hardly enough time to to even begin, and I apologize for that. Um, but I wanted you to just kind of begin to sample, to taste, to touch, to smell the materials, to feel the materials, to see if they're hard or soft, or you, the glue is easy to work with, or what you're responding to, oil pastels, uh, if you like collage, gluing on instead. Um, I was going to have us just find the person next to us and talk to each other uh, about what we've created, but I don't think we'll have time for that. So I invite you to take it home or keep it in with your notes and refer to it throughout this year, throughout our journey together, and add to it. Maybe something comes up that is distracting you more than you thought it would distract, besides the sun, you know, maybe it's uh, something at school or something personal or something with work or relational or physical. You know, you can add to it. If something disappeared, you can morph it into something else. So use it as a working drawing, a work in progress, something that you as a tool can use throughout the year. Add to it. If you find a word, a picture, uh, something that is helpful as a reference on your year's journey, 
as we begin together, then add that. I invite you to do that. So I was going to read about what a mandala is. We'll save that for another time together. It is a sacred circle used throughout the world to focus and to center. And I was just going to show you an illustration of one of, uh, and I did ask uh, the resident if I could use her um, drawings. Uh, a week ago Thursday, a uh, resident died. And he was one that went to flippers with us, participated in poker and current events and the other groups. And I came in on Thursday morning and got an email saying he had died not on at the building, but off um, campus, so to speak. Uh, and would I inform the residents? So I gathered them in a circle. We were supposed to be doing current events, and we did say what the date was and uh, as people were gathering. And, um, and I did say that when people come, we usually sit in a circle, which I wish we were in a circle, uh, to welcome them and invite them to participate uh, with us in whatever they choose to do. And then also when a resident uh, dies, we gather as a circle and um, honor that person. And we would have a time of remembrance. We had it this Monday with some of his family with us, a time of remembrance for him with some of his things. Well, that afternoon I had, uh, it was Thursday, and uh, a week ago Thursday, and I have a free drawing, just uh, art group. You can do anything you want. So I gave her a piece of paper, and this is what she did. And it has the person's name on it. And we will meet soon. Hope, fear, to the next space in time. Gone, never to return. You know, just speaking to the grief and shock and grief and sadness she felt. And so she was getting more and more agitated. So I asked her to put Take a deep breath and put some borders around. So she put the borders around, and after that, she was still agitated and starting to shake. So I took a plate. We were in the cafe. I took a plate and a clean piece of paper, and I drew a circle on it. And I said, just choose some colors that calm. Choose some colors and fill in the circle. This is her second drawing. And she spent about 15 minutes on this drawing. And at the end of it, she looked at me and said, thank you. So mandalas, centering, focus. So your mandala that you did, centering, focus. So as the year goes on and things get faster or more hectic, or you feel yourself getting more scattered, or things happen unexpectedly that take you by surprise, do a mandala to center. Um, and part of, I, I love uh, the works of Carl Jung, and um, so um, there's a woman that wrote on mandalas from a Jungian point of view. And she said, creating mandalas helps stabilize, integrate, and reorder inner life, inner life. And a quote from Carl Jung from Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And if you haven't read it, I invite you to do so. And this is a quote. I sketched every morning in a notebook a small circular drawing, which seemed to correspond to my inner situation at the time. Only gradually did I discover what the mandala really is, the self, with a large S, the wholeness of the personality, which if all goes well, is harmonious." Unquote. We have begun our journey together, and I thank you. <laughs>